requirement of freedom's not free. It always costing someone something huge. And the comfort would come and strength would come and we would be grateful for our, the liberty that we get to enjoy. And so tomorrow, whatever your plans can take you, we can be thankful for those who have laid their life down. And then we want to thank our Father for the greatest sacrifice and the greatest freedom that ever came. So Heavenly Father, we come into agreement this Memorial Day for the families of our country especially, but even throughout the world where men and women have been sent in harm's way and have often given the greatest sacrifice they can give, and that is their life. And so we pause and we remember that this freedom is not free. It costs. We pray, Father, for families that today are looking at this as not a holiday, but as a time of kind of bitter mourning still. And we pray for strength and courage. We ask that you would cause everyone, no matter what they think of the outcome of any of the conflicts, to not look at their death or the death of the ones they loved, I should say, as futile. But as you've taught us in your scriptures, that when a seed falls into the ground to die, it bears much fruit. And so, Lord, you are causing life to come from the deaths that have occurred and bringing the nation to recognize Jesus Christ and open hearts and change. So bring comfort, bring strength. Come alongside Holy Spirit. Bring um, nurturing and recovery and, and resurrection life. And Father, we pray that as all of the world, and especially America, that you would open our eyes to behold Jesus, the, the one and only sacrifice to, for all of humanity for all time and for his resurrection, to which now we, our faith is in. And we begin that life that he has, we receive and we thank you, Lord, that his blood is still crying out forgiveness, reconciliation, redemption. It is calling for all men to come into uh, sanctification and life. And so we pray, Holy Father, that even in our day, we will have an awareness that you have reconciled all things to yourself through your son. And that all of the movement of nations and the wars that we are in the midst of, that they will yield themselves and they will kiss the sun and nations will begin to behold that Jesus and his ways are life and liberty and freedom and wholeness for all people. And we thank you for doing something powerful tomorrow and watch over our nation and all of the families that come and go and all the things that will be happening. Make it a, a place of, of rest, recovery, and restoration for everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, when we begin, we'll begin in Hosea chapter 2. Let me find out which verse. There's so, so many different things happening. I know you hear that all the time. Probably verse 14, Sam. Um, it was a, a year ago, Memorial Day, that the night before the Lord had said to me on a Saturday night, I want you to go and understand the power of occupation. And so I went and looked by looking at the wars that we as a country have fought since World War, I, World War II. And uh, he began to teach a simple principle that what liberates must occupy. The force that frees must stay in place or the freedom that has been gained is, re is a vacuum and new forces come and take over. Which, And then he showed me this alarming st statistics, not that he showed them to me in an open vision. He led me to Google. <laughs> Some people think is an open vision, but it's good information anyway. That there are more troops in Germany, Japan, South Korea, stationed than any of the Middle East countries that we've been in conflict with uh, to like not just 10 times but maybe 30 times more. And that when we uh, uh, won the war of World War II, we understood that we, we were here to liberate people and nations, but we also understood that we had to keep an occupying force. So to this day, Germany, Japan, and um, South Korea have an occupying force. And since to this day, none of them have rebelled. None of them have resurged the, the, the 
chaos. And so that year ago, which was two years actually, I've been on a two-year journey with the Holy Spirit. And he's taken my heart and just continued to enlarge it about how much I need him and how much more of him is coming. And to have expectancy and, and sometimes fear. And I've shared a lot of my stories and with you on that. Because Jesus said that when he drove out the demons, and they were accusing him of doing it by Beelzebub, he wasn't, but he was doing it by the finger of God, which he described as the Holy Spirit. The disciples, when they were in trouble because the Sanhedrin told them, no longer don't talk about Jesus, they, they prayed that Father would stretch forth his hand to heal, and signs and wonders be done in the name of his holy servant, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit came. Holy Spirit is that hand of God, the finger of God, the, the, the power, the, the, the one who makes change. And when Jesus said, once the demon is driven out, if the house is not filled, then the Spirit goes and gets seven times more demons and seven times worse demons, and the, the state of the man is worse than the state he was in, which is something we've seen in the natural today as we now try to remedy ISIS in, in the Syria and Iraq and throughout the world. But it's the same in, in so much of our, our thinking and faith, that we, we go into a place of breakthrough, and then we think, oh, that's awesome, I'm going to stay here. And we don't realize we have to occupy it. We've got to be, let Holy Spirit have a f more fullness, more access, more praise, more worship, because he who just got us our liberty is the one who needs to remain in his place so he can have liberty or keep us in liberty. So one of the things we want to do, and I believe on purpose God has orchestrated a couple of events, and I just want to share them really quickly, is that um, next week on Sunday, Cammie and I will take, and with Ali and some of the Thailand team, will be down in Corona at the gathering place with uh, Ken Peters, who's a prophet who's been in our church many times and has been asking us to come and minister down in their house. At the same time, here, we are going to be having what we are calling and decreeing Increase Overflow Sunday in all areas of life. And you just heard the testimony of what one person comes under an increase and in, in overflow anointing. It just starts to, God can do over and above what we can ask or think. So we're going to intentionally move with that sound. We're going to have all the ministries and ministers and ministry teams in our church available to pray over four different areas, from finances to health to the soul to relationships to the destinies of people. And we're going to have, it's going to be powerful. Uh, Petey will be at the 9 o'clock service. Brian and Becky will lead on the 11 o'clock service. And in all of it, we're going to intentionally lean into something God's saying he is going, has initiated happening. We're not just now believing uh, holding our place. There is an, uh, there's an unction that says grab it. Yeah. Pull it in and pull it and, and take hold of it. That evening, Cammy and I will get on a plane and fly to Jerusalem or Tel Aviv and then we'll be picked up by um, Gregory and Jan and driven up to Jerusalem and we'll spend three days with them who they are our leaders of uh, our NGO in Israel called uh, Jubilee Humanitarian Aid. They're active in ministering to Israel and the Jewish people in love, in creative life-giving ways. They also are working to help uh, the, the refugees out of the Syrian and Iraq conflicts. And we're coming to, to release life and blessing. We're coming to bring the offering that you guys have given for us to sow into Israel. And uh, they're exiles inside a nation. They cannot leave the nation because their, their visa request is in committee. And that is that it's being decided. And that's been for two, almost three years in committee. If they leave, they have no access back in. And yet they have been prophesied they're going to have citizenship, residency, or an extended visa. They're wanted to be there by so many of Israel's from the Jewish agency, social services, like where um, Jordan's going to be serving among the young Aliyah Jewish children that are being sent without their family into Israel in hopes that there will be a better place for them as this world gets so agitated. Anyway, we'll be with them speaking life, receiving, giving, and then we're going to fly back quick enough to get down uh, to our son's graduation in San Diego 
on Saturday, and then we will be back here Sunday morning to, to release this blessing. Now, the reason I want to connect these is I hadn't connected all of this until the Lord spoke to me about that when Antioch, which was a church of the Gentiles, began to really shift into a whole other dy dynamic of ministry, was right after Paul and Barnabas had brought an offering to Jerusalem. And so we designated the month of May as a, to collect an offering to sow into Jerusalem. Because when they came back, they had received uh, experiences with God that they then set in motion in their church, which then opened a whole paradigm of sending people out and building a network of, of, of um, what we now know is just the way in which churches are born and families are saved and Paul and Barnabas became the, that, that team that just rocked the world. In fact, Paul got known with the reputation that they were those who turned the world upside down. So something powerful happened, and I believe there's moments when we can just intentionally lean into it. So I'm encouraging you, take advantage of this weekend. We're, I think there's something supernatural that's available, and, to, and, and we're shifting, and we're leaning, and we're, we're sending... And I tell you that when Cammie and I go someplace like, especially Israel, we are going with you. You are going with us. We are not just going just two people that, you know, carry some. We're carrying Jubilee. We're carrying the sound of freedom. We're carrying the, the call for liberation. And that place in the earth is more warred over than any other place in the world. Jerusalem is the capital of the world. Israel is the, is the nation, is the, is the eye of the Father. And whatever happens to, the, to the Israel is going to happen to the world almost immediately or afterwards. So we all prosper as Jerusalem rises, and we all are to hold her in our heart in prayer. So thank you for collecting in that. Now, two things. Let me see if I'll bring it. When do I do that? Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll see. Lord, uh, ask me to ask you, when you think of Jesus, do you see him as your master or your husband? And that's not a trick question. In other words, obviously the right answer is husband. But that's not the answer we usually begin with. When I got saved, he was my definitely my Lord and Savior, and he radically made my life new. I was so good. I just ruined it and at a ripe age of 13. I ran my life into drugs and all of that for six years. So by the time I'm 19 getting saved, I am really being liberated from a lot of darkness and learning to live in the freedom and the truths and the Word of God and deliverance that came and all of the beautiful things. But I also um, began to follow to know the Lord, to just really go, I, wanna, I really want to be pleasing to you. I want to honor what you've done for me. I want to, in, in thanksgiving, live up to what you've done. So I always became a student of the Word and studied and studied and learned and prayed, and I became a worshiper from the very get-go and a man of prayer. But, but uh, there was a motivation that kind of wanted me to kind of not have what happened to me happen again. So I was really intentional about growing in God. And Hosea, the whole chapter 2 is an incredible little story. The first part about it just seems like God's just so upset with Israel because they're just a, an idolatry everywhere. And, but, and you'd almost think that God is kind of you know, like, I'm mad at you, now I'm going to do something wonderful for you. He's mad at sin, and he's, he's, uh, he's after the things that captures his people. And idolatry captures us because we, without realizing it, we are trying to control our relationship with God because we're afraid. And that's what an idol really is. It's something that you can put in a cupboard, pull it out when you need it, put it back when you don't want it. It's access. It's how to do it in a certain way. It's Moses, Israel going to Moses saying, you go up and talk to God. And whatever he tells you, we'll do it. But we don't think we could handle a face-to-face -face relationship. So we learn patterns. We learn rules. We learn ways to live. And we try as best we can. And then what we find ourselves with 
is a lot of rules and patterns and techniques that may or may not leave us really super happy. I had this strange prayer in the early 90s. I said, Lord, I'd love to know your love apart from works. And then the Lord began to dismantle my works so that I could know his love. See, my works were my proof that he loved me. So to know his love apart from my works, he had my works fall apart. Which is what uh, uh, Hosea says in verse 14. I just want to read four verses. Uh, Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. So the Lord allures her to the wilderness to give her vineyards and then brings her to the valley of Achor. Now those who study your Bible know that the valley of Achor is another word for saying the valley of trouble. So I'm going to bring her into the valley of trouble so that, and the trouble began with Achor when he, at Jericho's uh, triumph, when they triumphed over the city of Jericho, he kept back some of the gold and silver for himself and hid it in his tent. And so from that point on, the Lord, they had to deal with that hypocrisy and that dis, uh, dis, uh, well, hypocrisy, just trying to hide and keep. His fearfulness was motivating him to hoard something that God had said, all of the gold and silver in this, in this battle is mine. So he had broken from what was already been expressed, and they ended up stoning he and his family, burning them, and then piling stones over them and calling that the, land, the Valley of Achor. So it seems like God often will take us into some of our crises of what we have been in covenant with that isn't going to be beneficial for eternity. See, God will make your life miserable for a minute so that he can enjoy you forever. Now, that doesn't mean that it's like he's, there's any punishment of any sort that has anything to do with you, you know, obtaining to be somebody wonderful enough for God to love you. You are so wonderful to be loved because Jesus said, I want you all. So, so um, quickly, let's go through this. The Valley of Achor is a place where you learn identity in God apart from what you have and what you don't have. And you turn from an idol worshiper, a controller of God, to a, a yielder of God, a pursuer of God, a surrender of God. And you, and you gain an identity where he becomes your husband and not your master. So he says, no longer will you call me. In that day, he says, Lord, that you shall call me my husband and no longer call me my master. Now, you would think, how would you shift into a husband-wife relationship with God from a master-servant relationship in the valley of Achor, in the day of trouble? Because you're learning to sing and reconnect to the one who saved you as in the days of Egypt, when you had nothing. You've been managing too much. Now you're returned to him. Let's go to verse 17. And then I will take from her mouth the names of Baal, and they shall be remembered by their name no more. And in that day I'll make a covenant with them. For with the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground, bow and sword of battle, I will shatter from earth to make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. If you are servant-minded relate in relationship, you hear that as a list of, wow, do I really have to be up to that dedication? But everything about Jesus is what I'm going to do for you. You're going to receive it, you're going to yield to it, you're going to accept it, and I'm going to do it. And you're going to believe, and that faith is going to be what I consider righteousness. And I'm going to just take you, and I'm going to use you. I'm going to, he says, it'll come to pass in that day, I will answer the heavens and the earth, and the Lord will answer the heavens, they'll answer the earth with grain, new wine, oil. They'll answer with Jezreel, and then I'll sow for myself in the earth, and I'll have mercy on who had not obtained mercy. And I'll say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and you shall say, you are my God. So this moment of shifting, which I think 
probably every one of you are in and I am in. It can go for years. It can continually be a renewal. When Cammie and I first got married, we loved each other with our whole heart, total dedication, commitment to each other for eternity. And, but you've got to learn how to live together. You, you love each other, but you don't know how to live it with each other. And I remember two things. One, Cammie was you know, in the homeschool and hearing a book, and people were talking about to the moms returning to some of the, you know, the, the ways in which to love your husband. And one of them was, get up early in the morning and make breakfast. Okay, so she thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get up early and make breakfast for Steve. But about that time, we had a whole scat of kids, like five of them. I think they were all under 10. So by the time she was getting up to make breakfast, the house was going unraveling because the kids were up, the things were happening. And all I really had wanted most of the time was just more sleep. Bowl of cereal and more sleep. You know what I mean? I don't need a fancy breakfast. Just give me some sleep, please. And um, so what would happen was that she would be up there making me breakfast, and I'd have to come down and rescue her from the tribe of the Ditmars that were hollering, screaming, moving around. And I was going, oh, you know, thanks. This is really great, but I don't need this. And that's kind of what a servant does when you're trying to win someone's affection or demonstrate affection without knowing them. You're doing what other people are telling you to do. You're trying to act in a way that somebody else gave you an idea. Everybody needs to do this. Everybody needs to do that. And it's like <clears throat> God does everything in, uh, with a pattern, but it's based on a principle. The principle is universal, but the pattern is unique. Cammy and I love to go shopping and I love to shop for her. She loves to shop for me. Uh, she'll look for things and go, oh, this is wonderful. My first question is, is it in my size? So you see, if I see something, the first thing I do is go through her, the dresses. Oh, there's your size. Okay, how would you like this? Because I know that if it isn't in her size, it's not even a, who cares? It doesn't going to work. See, that's, I think that way. Now, she's just, kind of, oh, this is just beautiful. We ought to all, you know, it'll, we'll, it'll work. I'm sure we'll find it somewhere. And it's like directions. I get my phone. I know where I'm going, and I'm on, and she's just kind of, I'm kind of, yeah, I feel like it's over here. We had fun times when Cammie would drive Heidi around in soccer. She once got lost down in Orange County in the Vietnamese city. She couldn't get to the, she could see the freeway, and we're on the phone. I can see the freeway. I can't get the on there. <laughs> But in all fairness, I have the same problem because I have to learn, you know, she is the most wonderful cook. You're going to, she cooks, she is a brilliant cook, but she does all by feel, not recipes. She just kind of knows what she's doing and where she's going with it. And so over time I've wanted, and at times I want to help with cooking. So I'll let, I, let me, let me, I'll, I'll work on this meal. So how about, what do I do? And I want, you know, I want measuring amounts, and I want certain uh, temperatures, and I want, I want all that. And she gives me none of it. She goes, well, you know, it's just, just put in a little of this, and put the, you know, just turn the oven on. And, and I've had to adapt myself, who is like, I'm muster math, and I want exacts. I've had to learn to cook like she cooks. I've had to just... You know, now I, I love it because it's, it's really easier because there's no rules. It's a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that. I think this sounds good. I look that. And, and most of the time it really works because it, it, most. <laughs> Cammie's really kind. She's, she knows how to keep me cooking. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the story that Husbands and wives, wives learn very quickly, which we are in a case. We're discovering that there are things that some, our husband doesn't know, and we have told them, but they can't hear. And you learn really quickly as a young wife that one day your husband comes in and says, I just heard God say. And you're going, 
And you just want to say, I've been telling you for five <laughs> years. You finally heard it. What are we talking about? But you realize if even if you bring that up, an argument begins. No, you haven't. You haven't been saying that. No, not that way anyway. Which, you know, and it's just so late. You learn this little... Oh, that's wonderful. You hear so well. It's awesome what a leader of the house you are. <laughs> and in our relationship with Jesus, that's more probably the way it's going to be, where he's letting you discover stuff. You know, have you ever gone to Lloyd and said, Lord, look what I found in the Bible. <laughs> look at this. I can't believe it. Have you, have you ever read this? <laughs> really, you've got to read this. This is awesome. And he's just all excited with us. Yeah, that's so great. Because the f husband... See, I, have a, I love being Jesus' wife. Because it's so cool. It's like really all the responsibilities on him. All I have to do is respond. And I'm inseparable. See, the first 17 years of my journey took me to a as far as I could go, and had I not yielded all back to God, I probably could have kept going that way and had a lot of success before in the, in the eyes of man, but I wouldn't have learned to be loved, and I wouldn't understand how inseparable I am inside of love. That I can't be separated from Jesus. He just, we are one. He can't get rid of me, and I can't get rid of him. No matter what I would do or not do, we have become absolutely inseparable. And the union we hold is entirely based in what he has done. And all of the promises he makes is my place of fellowship. And the accusations that I used to carry, why haven't you done this? Where have you been? How come it went so long? They just all kind of keep disappearing. And this, this, this glorious Lord just says, come on, Steve, let's let me show you the universe. Have you seen what I've been doing lately? Look at the world. I'm so excited about the world. And, and things that were paradigms I couldn't have seen because it was a natural, concrete thinking relationship. Well, we've got to do this, or God will do that. If God doesn't do this, then we won't be able to do that. God's, Jesus kind of goes around and goes, you know, I can do anything I want. I'm the boss. In case people forgot. I'm the boss. I can do anything I want, Steve. Why don't you just believe me? Okay, you're the boss. And it's also entitled me to a lot of access to him about, hey, I want something. You know, I really, I really want something right now. I go, what do you want? I want you to do this. Okay, cool. It's done. All right. It's done. And then we get the fellowship. Now, I had to learn not to go and look to see if it really was done. Right, ladies? Honey, will you take out the trash? No problem, it's done. Doesn't look done to me. Thing's still sitting there. There was a, about six months ago, I began to press the Lord for something I'd been on him for a season. And I thought, I'm going to really use my faith. And I started using my faith in a kind of a reminding him of his promises. And finally, he said to me, he said, you are like a nagging wife. <laughs> I thought... That's cool. <laughs> That's really cool because all I got to do is you don't like my approach, but you haven't denied who I am. I am your wife. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't want to be a nag. I mean, I, we all know what that feels like. It's giving the right answer in the wrong time. It's doing the right thing, but for the wrong reason because fear is pushing you. little Christian learned to try his shoes the other day. And so he's wanting to show everybody I can tie my shoe. He made Gino take a video of it and put it on YouTube. Uh, so he's wanting to show Nana, Cammie, right before she was trying to bring him for piano lessons over to the church. So he's going, I want to show you, I want to, I want to, tie, I want to show you I can tie my shoe. No, no, I'm going to just tie it because we've got to get to piano lesson. And so the transaction happens. On the way home, he says, Nana, don't you, aren't you proud of me? that I can tie my shoe? She says, yeah, I'm proud of you that you can tie your shoe, but I'm not proud of you that you wouldn't listen to me and make us late to something we'd already committed to. 
You're, doing the, you're trying to show me the right thing at the wrong time. You don't understand my voice enough to be able to know that at this moment, I just need this from you. I want this. And that's this kind of relationship that God's trying to build us all. So he's trying to think that out. How does that work? How does that work? How, I don't, how could that tie in my shoe, such an important success milestone be? He, she, Cammy said, well, you know your brother Noah. When he, you know, at times it's dinner time and, he, and he's hungry, but he's refusing to eat. And, and, we're, and you're going, come on, Noah, it's time to eat. No, no. And then when he's getting ready for bed, all of a sudden, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. That's the right answer at the wrong time. It's not the appropriate place. And that really is more about God than you I've, I ever knew. He delights in a right response. Let me give you this idea, which is so revolutionary. It's scary. And then I'm going to tell you these two stories, and we'll be done. Recently, the Lord has challenged my faith as I worship and try not to be a nagging wife. <laughs> I'm good at being a nagging wife, too. I, I've got the word down. <laughs> I got it down. I, I have him. He's, this is a contract. Did you know that? It's a covenant. <laughs> Pay. In any case, he said, you know, Steve, I wanted to show you something. When I raised my son, your older brother, your husband, from the dead, he was in the bowels of hell, and I called him forth by calling him to be my son, the firstborn among many brethren. Holy Spirit came. He burst forth into life. He took the keys of death and hell. He, he, be, he triumphed over all the principalities and powers. He, he spoiled them, dragged them through. It was a raucous rock and roll party. He was the winner. Hell became his headquarters. He preached. He led captivity captive. He ascended on high. He put his blood everywhere, made accessible to heaven, man accessible to heaven. And then he sent the Holy Spirit. And then you know what I told him to do? I told him, son, I want you to sit down. And you know why I told him to sit down? Because I reserve the final completion of the victory. So he said, I, want it. I told him, sit down till I make your enemies your footstool. Yeah. So I understood something, what Papa was telling me. He says, if you're about ready to have a victory, sit down. Give God the honor of the victory. Real trust is when you sit down in the presence of your enemies and have tea. <laughs> you know... When he took me to camp on a mountain of, 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 of fear and, and war and trouble, he said, we're going to go camping here. And I said, I don't want to camp here. He says, why? Because it's scary. He says, yeah, but I'm here. Yeah, but still it's scary. And he just said, keep your eyes on me. Because I need you to be able to know me in the intimacy of who I am here. Or you're of no use to liberate all those other people out there. You see, the reason some of our sonship, husband, daughter relationship is that we have to be, we have to discover this in adverse circumstances for it to have the power to resist the adversity of our adversary. He will not... Just sit by idly when you get a great revelation. And go, oh, wow, he got a great revelation. We're, let's pack up and go. No, he f gets fear fearfully agitated trying to shut that up revelation down. So part of the way the Father lets us grow up in the Holy Spirit is he fills us with the Holy Spirit and then introduces us to the devil. Fills us with the Holy Spirit and introduces us to the devil. And part of the, the discovery is... This is what I'm learning is the victory really, really, we go hands down. I mean, when you can sit and you can rest and you can worship and you can just receive and you can just delight yourself because there's a Psalm 45 talks about for women who were captured, it says, daughter, forget your father's house and the king will greatly desire your beauty. And here is, the ki here is the daughter of the king, all glorious within. And that comes out of Deuteronomy 21. 
that when, uh, when Israel would capture an, uh, a triumph in a war, if, if an Israeli soldier saw, saw a beautiful woman and wanted her to be his wife, he could take her home. She would then, he would shave her head, cut off her, cut, trim her nails, cut her fingernails back, and she'd wear new clothing, and she would mourn her father's family for a month. Then after that, he could bring her into his family, and she could be his wife. If at the end of that month he didn't like her as he thought he did, he had to let her go free because he had humbled her. The, the power of losing and letting go and releasing things that once were dear and familiar and part of our life is the, is the I believe, the place where, where what happens is we move from being aliens to sons. We move from being servants to wives. And once that has happened, there is no separation. There never was anyway, but now you know it. See, I'm dangerous because I know I can't be separated. I used to be get cursed by all kinds of people. They just cursed me all the time. You look funny. God's not mad at not liking you. You didn't pray long enough. God's after you. And I'd go pray harder and try to look nicer. And that's stupid. It's absolutely stupid because I can never look nice enough for God to like me. I'm just his favorite one. He just, after he's just pursuing me, even when I'm nagging him, because I am known by him. We have, I have been humbled by him. I have lost many things to gain him. I've learned to forget everything behind me in order to take hold of the thing in front of me. I have been trained in relationship, union. I know how to cook when he doesn't give me instructions. And I know that he doesn't really care about breakfast the way I might have thought he had to have it. He looks at my heart. He, I mean, it, we, the relationship is so unpretentious. Uh, the word is truth. It's, it's is, is his, the essence of who he is is just beyond. But yet there's so much more. There's so much more that I have yet to discover. So I'm learning to sit with expectancy. Think about it. Jesus is sitting. That's his job for 2,000 years and to stay in intercession over our promises. Sit. No problem, Dad. We got this thing down, don't we? Oh, man, it was so cool. I'm just so agreement of the eternal purposes that were accomplished in me before the foundation of the world secured through my death and burial and resurrection. We are winning this thing so big. The church is so beautiful. I can't wait to get married. And you and I are looking around going, what church are you talking about? <laughs> because he doesn't look at what he sees. He looks at the eternal and he's in rest. Anytime I'm out of rest, I am not going to win. So let me tell you a story of unrest. <laughs> and I, I'm going to tell you two stories just because they've come back to me, and I think one is really short. When I go away next week, I'm going to share two things with this, the Corona Church and probably share it in some other places. One of the things the Lord at, said to me, he said, I want you to begin to tell people when you go places to honor those who serve them. Because I separated my, my sons and daughters to be ministers to me, and I gave them no inheritance. And people have uh, lost the value of those who serve them in my house. And therefore, their whole lives are locked up because they have considered everything common and not certain things holy. So I'm going to go, and I'm going I'm I'm to have so much fun. I'm telling you this because I don't feel, I feel like if I go to tell somebody this, I should tell you what I'm going to go tell. I'm going to go all these places and tell people, you guys got to love your pastor. You got to do something really cool for them. Get creative. Get powerful. Get, do something awesome. Because I know that God is commissioning me to liberate people from a backslidden state because they have pulled back what is God's. Because God said to the, those who serve him, you don't get an inheritance on the earth. I'm your inheritance. And my inheritance will come to you through my people. So if the people clog up, the inheritance begins to be defiled, and the priests go off, and they can't do their job. So I know there's something really supernatural. So I'm looking forward to telling people wherever I go about that. The second thing I'm going to share is super 
personal because it's a dream I had. And I'll tell it to you in about three minutes. This happened the night, the morning before Azusa Now. So Azusa Now was to be gathering to recall forth out on April the 9th. So this happened April 8th. I woke up in the morning dreaming a dream. I was sitting outside a building that represented to me ministry. I knew it was ministry. And I'm sitting outside and my phone rings. It's a number I don't recognize, so I do what I do with all numbers I don't recognize. I just pushed silence. Because I don't want to, you know, have, I don't know who it is. And if it's important, they'll leave me a voice message, right? Isn't that what you do? Yeah. We all know that. If you don't leave me a voice message, you don't need to call you back. So those are my rules. <laughs> anyway, I pushed. And next thing you know, I'm holding an iPad, and this person is FaceTiming me. And I'm, I'm really ticked. I'm offended. I go, I go, I said, man, that's some high-tech invasion you just did. And next thing I know, he's, in, he's standing in front of me. He's older than I am, and he's wearing a tracksuit. Like the Russians wore when we back in the 90s, when they, you know, little white, you know, little striped down. I mean, it was it was outdated. But he looked really good. He looked better than I did. He was older than I, but he looked in better shape. He just had this confidence, clarity, excitement. And he's saying, I've come, I've come. I said, Who are you? He said, Oh, you know me. We we used to hang out. We were back to, back at Hillcrest days. Now, Hillcrest was a church Dan Peters and Juanine were a part of, which was major in the Jesus movement and, and um, the uh, whole charismatic renewal. And it's, now it's only known by the high school that's still there. But I'm going, well, I don't really recognize you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's kind of conversing. I'm kind of wondering, who is this guy? And he goes walking through the front door into the, into the lobby area. And next thing you know, he's standing behind a, kind of a lobby desk like a hotel and he's checking himself in and I'm going and I'm thinking what do I do this is my little thing I'm supposed to be watching out for and who is this guy and he doesn't look I said I said can I I'll need some form of identification so he hands me two cards and I look them up with my phone I, I remember I'm using my map and my you know internet and just and I, I discover he's got two positions at Westmont College up in Santa Barbara, Montecito. So I feel a little more comfortable because that's an evangelical, conservative church, you know, campus, so okay. Anyway, it really didn't matter because he was staying. He wasn't, he wasn't asking my permission. He was just checking in. He finishes that, and we, he, we go back to the back part of the building, and it's like classrooms, and he's just walking around familiarizing himself. Like he's been here before and delights in it. And I'm, I'm following around peppering him with questions. Who are you? Oh, yeah, we, we know each other. We just, you know, it's just so good to be here, good to be with you. I can't wait what we're doing. And, I, you know, we know so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and, and it seemed like he was just invading while being super evasive. I couldn't nail him down on anything, and I'm just... Meanwhile, he pulls out this big old syringe, hyperdermic needle. I mean, just scary-looking. And he goes, you know, in a little bit, I'm going to give you a shot with this, and it's going, to, it's going to really give you strength. And he's not asking me, would you like a shot? <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you a shot. And I'm really thinking, well, 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 I don't know what's in it. I don't know who you are. I don't know if it's, san you know, uh, been clean, if it's sanitized. I mean, silly. He pulled out of his pocket. <laughs> Big old needle. He's. I'm gonna give this to you. And I'm going, and I'm and I'm trying to be everything that you would a leader supposed to be. You know, I'm trying to give room and and yet not jump to conclusions. But I'm really not comfortable with this. And when just a little bit time goes by, and he he walks by me. He says, "Well, you almost don't really need it." So, and I go, oh, I just felt this sigh of relief and control coming back. And, oh. and just at that time. I asked one of his assistants who was with him, I said, well, what, what's in that? I mean, have you had this shot before? He said, yeah, it gives you a lot of strength, kind of like vitamins. And right then a lady walked by in this little, little threshold. I was on a little threshold. And she says, yeah, but you, it, it, you have to believe for it to work. 
To which I didn't know, was she siding with me in my doubt? That this, you know, wondering if this is just a placebo and it's just some kind of a, you know, whatever control thing he's doing? Or was it indeed um, that I needed faith or it wouldn't have worked? Anyway, we now go back into the lobby where he is. And he's sprawled out on the floor, kind of like a reclining lounge. And there's kids and children and childlike adults all jumping up and down on him, bouncing up and down. I would think, I knew if I, in the natural, that would hurt. Because I have a three-year-old grandson or, that loves to jump on me. And it's like, I've got to go, let me get ready. Because I can't let you just land anywhere without me being prepared. But he was just laughing, and people were bending him, contorting him, jumping on him, and it was just, it was just gloriously hilarious. And I'm going, oh, I'm just getting, I, I, I found myself, I had to get out. I just got out of the building. And I'm stand, sitting there, just going, I don't know what to do. Who is this guy? Where did he come from? What is he going to do? What is this happening? And I'm just trying to sort this out. Seems that the dream went a little bit of time because I go back into the lobby, and now the lobby has changed. It's, it's effervescent, full of light, color. People are filling things everywhere. It's just like everything. He's like, oh, wow. And, and this gentleman in the tracksuit is sitting, standing there talking to Brian. And so I walk up, and he says, okay, it's finished. It's done. I will f- provide for everything. I will fund everything. I will resource and I will cause all things to succeed. I have one condition. Again, I didn't even know we were having a conversation, but he's just injecting. You have to listen only to my music. And I said to him, you mean I can't stream other worship music? He says, no, you have to listen to my song. I wanted to say, yeah. I mean, I love what I see, what you've done with the place. But I didn't know if I should, so I turn away and look, look away from him, and I'm just trying to really, you know, all the sense of responsibility, what do I need to do? And finally, I hear myself say, no. And as soon as I said no, it was the only time I ever saw his face get sad. Because he carried himself with such, like, youthful wonder, delight, confidence, just nothing, nothing uh, aggr- uh, arrogant, but all utter f- completeness. Anyway, as soon as I said no, all the color left. The people began to move away, and things began to return to where they were. And I said, oh. He came up to me with a sad look, and it was the only time I saw him disappointed. And he said, you know, you only said no because you're afraid. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. But I have a responsibility for this place and these people. Then he looked at me with the, with the sad eyes and said, you know, this won't even be here in a year. And it's right then I realized, you're the Holy Spirit. You're the Holy Spirit. And I just told you no. I woke up shaking. And I told Cammy, I'm going, Cammy, I am a fraud. I am a big fraud. I, I act as though I'm so open to everything of the Holy Spirit, but I, he just came. You see, I had to go take a walk and spend hours before the Lord trying to just repent. You see, his freedom intimidated my captivity. His joy threatened my, my sorrow. He, it was like he threatened without being any way accusative. He did not ever have a vindictiveness or because you did I must and you're in trouble now it was none of those things it was just always this I've got plans let's go but no I'm not you know he had an evasiveness in his invasion so I couldn't nail him pin him down so when this finally I'm going and praying and I'm saying because I've learned something for the first 17 years of my life and almost the next 17 years I thought that everything was about a right answer or a wrong answer so if I had a dream like that, I would make vows. I'd wake up the next morning and go, God in heaven, no matter what you do, I want you. Give me any syringe you've got. Do whatever you've got to do. I promise you, I will not do that. I will. Thank you for warning me. Whereas now I don't read that like that. I read that as, that's who I am. That's exactly what I'm going to do. That's exactly who I am. I don't, I'm not even going to try to say that's not me. That's me. So I repent for doing it before I've done it. 
and I acknowledge this is me, and my fearfulness and controlling is still ever present, and I want you to, to address it, and I want to invite you in because I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, can't, I can't change myself, but you're pointing out to me how much you need to change me. But I can't change myself, so I accept this. Yes, this is true. You're speaking truth to who I am. Please, let the work of the cross and the love of God and the, and the, the completeness take over. And I found myself so delighted because I knew he's coming. I told you I met my friend a few weeks before that. But I know he's coming as a person, not an influence, not just a little more, a little dab will do you. This is the person of the Holy Spirit coming to take over and bring forth his liberty to reveal the song of Jesus back in the earth. And I am not ready. <laughs> and I'm going to be freaked out. He's going to invade my privacy. He's going to step into my secret places and show up and FaceTime me. He's going to walk in and check in without anybody inviting him. He's going to sit down and begin to familiarize himself with operations and start to operate, and he's going to pull out this hunkin syringe. <laughs> and I'm going to go, I can't understand you, and he's going to let all these people do these wonderful, crazy, non-abusive things of jumping up and down and laughing and being childlike. He's, he's going to let that, he's going to enjoy that. He's going to delight in that. And then he's going to come and say, I've got it. I've got the whole thing. We're going to just cause this to be everything I want it to be. But you just have to listen to my song. And that, the, the, what, what seems to be the, such exclusivity then that he claims to our life. And it's just, it's crazy. I forgot all about the dream. I wrote it down that afternoon. It was so supernatural. Two-hour dream, two-hour walk. Cammy had to be out, and I was all by myself, so I sat down, and I wrote the dream out. And then I, I knew it was for me just to repent. I'm just walking around going, oh, gosh, Lord, whatever. I'm just, you know, you're in charge. I don't know what you're about to do. And then about one week ago, two weeks ago now, the Lord brought the dream back to my mind. He said, this is the struggle that we will, you know, he just started to have me share it with a few people and then I share with the Father's heart. And I don't share it with you now to say, okay, we've got to get ready for something because we are, need to make sure we do it in the right way. It's just, he's coming. And he's going to occupy because if he doesn't occupy, we can't keep a victory. The land will be given back to the problem that it was liberated from. So I... Ah, so I go around all the time. Lord, I just make me into the person Jesus Christ paid for me to become. Make me become what you've made me be. I give you room. I give you permission. I'm going to sit. I'll be happy, quiet, not nagging you, trusting you, delighting in you, worshiping you, engaging in you. And, and yes, come and come and come and come. Come because we can't do church without you. And we're not, we, have, we have a little smidgen of you in, resid, in almost a, you know, it, you're answering the prayer of my prayer, for, but, oh, you're so frightening because you're so complete. You, I, I see my flaws when I see you, but you don't see my flaws. You don't even regard them as any of importance. So that's what I'm going to share next week. And probably in, in Thailand too, because there's something about the resurrection life. Here, let me, here's what I know about being married to Jesus. He's a resurrected man. And so shall we be. And so we are becoming. So the deaths we've incurred is so that we could know resurrection life. And that resurrection life is going to take a form that we have not yet been able to grasp or, or identify, but as it begins to take form, we will yield into and begin to have an intimacy with God that is outside of any of the intimacies we've learned to this level, to this day. And I'm thrilled with that and frightened about it. But I believe there's something for the humanity outside. They need to see Jesus come alive inside his church. Amen. And if the Holy Spirit has to show up in a tracksuit, whatever. <laughs> you know, I, who am I to tell him what he has to wear? Can we stand up? <laughs> All right.
right, so I just opened my entire being up to you. But I, whatever. Lord, I am grateful for a company of people that are in very much the same journey I'm in. Some who have journeyed longer than I have. Holy Spirit, we love you. We know your ministry is to sing the song of Jesus and to magnify the Lord. We know that you are the only power that is available to make the witness of Jesus tangible and lift up people out of captivity. We know you have the ability to break into any, any life in any moment in any time and reveal Jesus Christ. And in so doing, save and call forth to freedom and fulfillment. We know that the captivity on the earth is stark and strong, but you are great and loving and liberating. And Lord, we know that there are ways in which we've had to learn to operate in our fledging little operations of life that hold things in a, in a semblance of goodness and order, but you might threaten and challenge us as you come, not with animosity or, in, or frustration, but just in your freedom and liberty. So Holy Spirit, bring Jesus, and may we start to hear the song of Jesus fresh and new. Play on our radio. Lord, it's my simple prayer. I don't know how to even choose your station, let alone recognize it, let alone come to the point where it becomes an exclusive sound that I'm listening to. So, Lord, please start bringing the music now. Capture my attention while I'm wandering. Uh, capture me while I'm being defensive. Uh, invade me while I'm trying to uh, ignore you. Come and find access. Talk to me in a familiar tone without answering the direct questions. I, don't, I know there's so many barriers that we carry that we don't even realize that you have been our master for too long and you're coming to be our husband. Holy Spirit, help us in this season, in this time we're in, and activate for each one. Right now, the Spirit of the Lord, I'm going to shift and close this prophetically, is standing in front of so many of us and, he's, and he is as, as not a, an influence, but as the person. And he's bringing you Jesus. And he's stepping and placing a new seal of imprint. It's like he's putting a new, new set of, of, of words inside our thoughts and inside our hearts. And he's sealing them because he's the down payer, down payment. And he is saying, don't be afraid because I've got you. And I am fully engaged in carrying you to the other side. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or how you got here. I've got you. And I'm carrying you now. I have justified you. I have glorified you. And I've brought you into union. I'm going to unveil your eyes to see and your ears to hear and your heart will understand. Some of it little by little, others in abrupt moments. But I want you to know I'm for you. I am for you because of Christ. He has done it all for you. Therefore, I am for you in Christ. And I will make who he is to be who you are. And who you are will be who he is. And I will bring the union that I accomplished in the resurrection as he, the firstborn, was born again. So I'm bringing forth the resurrection life inside of you. And you will begin to rest in victory while sit, sitting in the midst of conflict. And you will begin to enjoy my joy when your sorrow would seemingly overtake you. For I am changing you from the inside out, and I am raising up the voice of my son. You will hear his voice, and as you hear his voice, you will live. For I am a life-giving God, and I have saved my church, and I have called for the last season to be a greater season than all seasons before. So rest in me. Follow me. Allow me influencing you. Give me permission. Be at peace. I will not accuse you. I will not condemn you. And I will not separate you. I will justify you. I will glorify you. And I will make you one with me. For I am the spirit of the living God come to magnify the son of God in his resurrected form 
and you will be witnesses to him of his great goodness and glory and victory. And you will be the first to declare, come see the man who told me all things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Come see the liberator of my soul. Come hear the song of freedom. Come delight yourself in the lover of my soul. Look at my husband, how stately and strong and majestic he is. You will begin to sing of my Jesus as your Jesus in the glorious tone that will cause an attraction for many to behold. For he has become for you salvation and wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. And now he is rising up in you, stepping up inside of you. So don't be afraid. Give me permission. I'm coming anyway, but give me as much as you can and let's go together. Let's discover this together. For what I'm bringing is greater than what you've known before. And paradigms are about to shift. And mindsets are going to change. And you're going to try to do things that aren't going to work anymore. But I'm going to do new things that never worked before. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to have a grand, glorious, happy time. I'll play with. I'll, vict- I'll bring praise. I'll bring joy. I'll bring provision. I'll bring healing. I'll bring miracles. I'll bring everything that Jesus afforded you and bought you. Now give me that place. I'm taking that place. Give Jesus his praise. He is deserving of worship. Anticipate. Look for. Expect. Because I'm here. I'm taking over. I'm not leaving my land, and I'm not letting go of my people, and I'm not going to be driven out by accusation or religious thinking. I'm taking over. I'm filling up my house, filling up my people, filling up my church. I'm filling everything till it, it magnifies the sun, and I will drive out that which has destroyed so many, and I will liberate because I am a liberator. I am good, and I am God. And I am here for Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Mm. So the ministry team will be available. Let's just, I want to release one blessing. Father, seal what you're doing. Grace us with your coming. We welcome as best we can to, for you to visit and to stay and to inhabit and to take over and to fill in all things. And we thank you for this weekend and the Memorial Day that we get to celebrate. Again, be the comforter of the earth and of all families, especially those who've lost loved ones. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.